Yeah, so we're going to uh, talk about object detection and we're going to see like, how that task is uh, typically solved nowadays with using deep learning techniques. So first, let's define why, what uh, object detection is, although I think that the name speaks for itself already. But So object detection is the task of given an image. Uh, we want to assign a bounding box and a label for each one of the objects that are present in that image. Right? So that's the task that we need to, we need to solve. So first, before we begin and dive into the algorithms that uh, are existing in the, in the literature, let's talk about uh, briefly about the data sets that are commonly used in computer vision. So these would be data sets of object detection, but general object detection, so objects of any kind. So we have three popular data sets that are of increasing size. So we have Pascal visual object uh, categories, which has 20 categories and has about 6,000 uh, uh, images for training, validation, and then uh, 10,000 images for testing. Then uh, a few years after, Microsoft Coco was released, which increases in size and in the number of categories. So it has now uh, 80 object categories. And then uh, more recently, we had ImageNet, which I think that was mentioned in, in previous lectures. So they had the uh, classification challenge, but now they also introduced the object detection challenge. And they have even more images and more uh, categories. So it's a more challenging task, and it has more data. <coughs> so yeah, let's start as to defining how one can solve object detection using previous tools that have been introduced before. So you could treat object detection as a classification task, which would be, OK, so we have an image, and we just want to know where the objects are. So we can just take a, a bounding box and put it somewhere and evaluate and extract some features in that location and decide if there's something in there or, or it's, there's, no, there's nothing in there. So imagine that we have a problem here where we want to detect cats, dogs, and ducks. So we get our bounding box there, and we extract some features there, and we say, OK, there's nothing. OK, so we move our bounding box somewhere else, and we do the same. Is there something in here? No? OK, we move. And we could do this over and over, but you can see that this very quickly uh, yeah, explodes. So we would need to test every location for many different bounding boxes of different sizes and different scales. And we need to evaluate and extract some features in there and evaluate our classifier. So that's a valid option if your classifier is very fast. So if, if it takes uh, negligible time, then you can do it everywhere. You have millions of locations, millions of bounding boxes. You just do that. And then you have, uh, yeah, so all possible um, locations evaluated. But so we've been talking about uh, deep networks. And I guess that we've uh, said that this many times before, but this is not uh, uh, fast classifier, right? So it has a lot of parameters and it takes uh, a significant amount of time to, to evaluate on a single image. So we cannot evaluate millions of locations for a given image using this classifier. We need to do something that's smarter. So what was uh, done in order to overcome this limitation is just instead of looking everywhere in all possible locations, all possible scales and bounding box sizes, we just choose or yeah, so pick one of uh, some of these uh, location and some of these uh, bounding boxes. We decide which ones are more promising, and then we evaluate only on those on that on that subset. So this uh, uh, phase of of deciding which locations we're going to evaluate is called uh, object proposals or region proposals, which are techniques that, given an image, they give you a set of uh, prominent locations where objects could be present. So you run this uh, detector and you get uh, like a class agnostic uh, detection uh, result where you get bounding boxes and locations that sort of maybe objects are present, right? So for an image, we have this type of output. And then, so once we, we have that, yeah, so here would be, uh, sorry, two uh, techniques that were proposed uh, in the literature like yeah, a few years back that did exactly that. So using whatever the technique, uh, take an image and give set of proposals. So we have selective search in one side that outputs bounding boxes. So it's, it's only a yeah, bounding box for the images. And then we have other techniques that not only they give you bounding boxes, but they give you segments. So proposals that are segments in the image and not uh, bounding boxes. So that's actually using this uh, technique. That's what was chosen to do. Uh, in 2014, so using deep learning, this was the first technique that uh, aimed at uh, solving object detection using uh, these deep networks. And what we did, they did was they used selective search. So given an image, you have a set of proposals. And what you just do is you take these proposals and you evaluate a deep network on all of them. So that's what this is doing. You have input image, you extract proposals. So you don't have millions anymore. You have like 2,000. And then for each one of these 2,000, you train a network to classify each one of these 2,000 proposals into a category in your data set. Okay? So that's the way that they solved uh, detection, because at the end, you have 2,000 boxes that are uh, scored 
for these uh, classes and that you just can, can just rank them and choose a threshold and then you have a result. You have a set of boxes that are certain classes in the, in the image. So uh, yeah, so RCNN worked like that. So what they did, actually this uh, pipeline was not end-to-end, -end, so in the sense that you don't train from the image to the, to, the, to the final output. So they first train this first part in which they have the proposals and they obtain scores. And then what they do is they take the, uh, the, the features before the classifier, so FC7 features. So this would be the last fully connected layer before the classifier. And with that, they train another classifier to, again, uh, classify between these uh, 20 classes. And then they also train box regressors. So a box regressor would be given each one of these 2,000 proposals, what you want to do is know how much you would need to move each one of the coordinates in order for the detection to improve. So they train first the deep network using this approach, and then they train again another set of classifiers to uh, uh, obtain the final result. So there's also another thing that I want to mention is that, uh, so the output of this type of uh, technique and the ones that I'm going to introduce uh, afterwards, so we want a result that looks like that, right? So we want an image and we want only bounding boxes and, and yeah, so detections only where objects are present. But these techniques output something like this, which is, you know, for each one of the 2,000 proposals, you have a score, right? So every one of these uh, proposals is, is an output. And then you have to decide a threshold to say, okay, if uh, every box that is, uh, has a uh, probability higher than 50% counts as a, as a positive, so I believe that score. But you have to threshold that. You have to learn that threshold in order to eliminate as many of these false positives as possible. Okay? So there's a, there's a step that you need to do in order to get, go from here to there. You need to discard many, many of your outputs. So, so yeah, so for that we use a technique that it's called non-maximum suppression, which, uh, so if you have two boxes that are very similar and one has a higher score than the other, you eliminate the one with lower score, that's one thing. And then the score threshold, you just trust a set of your predictions, not all of them, okay? So these are the, like, the basic three steps of RCNN. So even though this is a relatively old method now, and I'm, now I'm going to present like improvements towards this, uh, well, that were done to this method, back in the day it performed really, really well. So here we have DPM. This is a technique that was in the era of the well, pre-deep pre learning era. And then we have RCNN, uh, an RCNN train with the bounding box regressors and the additional classifier that I was mentioning and using AlexNet and VGG. So you can see that the average precision, which is the metric used to evaluate this, these techniques uh, got uh, significantly higher. So even though it's a, an old uh, technique, it was really important back in the day. So, but it has some problems, right? I think I already hinted at them, but there's a few issues. So the first one would be, okay, for each one of the images, we need to extract the proposals and we need to forward them through the network. So if we have 2,000 proposals, we need to do forward 2,000 times. So it's very slow at test time. For one image, you have to do that 2,000 times and then you have to filter out the, the results. So there's also another problem, which is that I mentioned already, is that uh, the final results are not given by the direct output of, of our network, but SVMs and box regressors are trained after that. So what that means is that the output of these classifiers that are trained afterwards in post-processing don't have any impact in the features that are learned in the deep network. So it's like a, a two-stage uh, approach. So yeah, so all in all, it's a multi-stage multi -stage training pipeline, which I guess we don't like and we could maybe think of something better. So actually that's sort of what they did uh, the year after. So they proposed this technique. So they are uh, very original with the names, I guess, fast RCNN, which aims to solve these problems that RCNN had. So the first problem uh, that I mentioned is that uh, RCNN is very slow at test time because you need to do forward pass for all of the proposals. So what they did was a very uh, simple trick in order to make it faster, which is, okay, so I have my image and I have proposals. And instead of uh, running the, each one of the proposals, like the, the cropped, uh, so the cropped or the cropped of the image in the, with the bounding box, running it through the whole pipeline, what if I just run the whole image through all the convolutional layers, and then in that convolutional layer, I take my proposals and I just take the portions of the activation of the last convolutional layer, and then I evaluate that. So then I save a, a lot of time because I just run most of the forward pass only once, and then I stop at some point, and then there I evaluate proposals. So that's actually uh, what they did. So that's the first solution, sharing the computation of the convolutional layers for all, all of the proposals in one image. 
So yeah, the way that this would work, I already more or less explained. So you have uh, your image, and so you here it would be all the convolutional uh, layers, and you end up with the convolutional features of this 3D volume. And then for each one of your proposals for, for your image, you go to the, the, the convolutional feature, and then you just scale your proposal, so the bounding box is smaller now. And then you just crop that portion of activations, and you warp it so that it, it becomes a fixed uh, length um, vector. And then in there, you apply your classifier. So that's, that's how it works. So then, yeah, the second problem of RCNN is that there was like a multi-stage pipeline. You first train your network, and then you take features, and then you train classifiers and box regressors. So here in fast RCNN, what they do is they just uh, train everything end-to-end. -end. So they define a multitask loss in which you, for each one of the proposals, you have your uh, softmax as we did before. So you're training to uh, recognize each one of the 20 categories in your data set, or 20 or whatever uh, the data set has. And then there's another uh, layer that is trained for the box uh, to, to do the task of box regressor. So it's training to uh, predict the offsets that are required to be applied in each one of the coordinates for each proposal. So you have now two losses instead of one, and you just train them together. You just add them, and you put some weights, uh, you weight them, and then you just backpropagate and train the whole thing together. So with these uh, um, improvements that were presented, uh, Basically, what, they, what happens is that now the, the system is a lot faster because you're sharing computation of the convolutional layer, so you're not doing forward pass 2,000 times. You do it once, and then you just do small computation on 2,000 uh, proposals. So it's faster in training, it's faster in testing, and it's better. So I guess complete success, right? So it's a complete success, I guess, because it's, it's better, so it's a clear improvement, but the test time doesn't include the computation of the proposals. So for each one of the images, you have to go to selective search, uh, do some computation there, get your boxes, and then you can evaluate on faster CNN. But you need the proposals. And the proposals take about one second and a half, and that you have to add into the testing time. So it's not that good anymore, right? Two seconds, it's not, yeah, we want something better. So yeah, they thought of that, I guess. So because the, uh, afterwards, I guess the next year or so, they proposed faster RCNN, which overcomes uh, that limitation. So you can see that it's, it's uh, pretty much faster, fast RCNN, so the previous um, architecture. So this, what is highlighted, that's fast RCNN, exactly that. But what they do is they add another branch that takes the shared features from the convolutional uh, layers, and it, from, from, that, from those features, it predicts uh, the proposals. So it learns to find bounding boxes, which are likely to contain objects, and then it uses those boxes to classify. But everything is shared, so the features from the, from the image are shared, and are used both to predict proposals and to classify them. So how this, does this region proposal network work? So you have, so the input of this region proposal network is the convolutional layer, so the, the output of the last convolutional layer. And what you will do there is you will take a, a filter of three by three, and you would put it in each one of the positions, like the spatial location. So you can think of it's, it's exactly a convolution, right? So in each of these uh, locations, you apply your filter, and you extract some features. So you would get, in, case, in this case, 256 features at each location. So then from this uh, vector, you predict two things. You predict uh, uh, objectness scores. So this would be two, two values. So either it's uh, an object or it's not. So it's a binary classification problem. That's one side. And the other side is predicting the box coordinates, as, as we had before. So we're predicting the, the offsets that we need to apply. So we need to make in which direction we need to move each one of the coordinates of the bounding box to make it better. So that's uh, applied at each of the locations. And not only that, so this is only a single convolution. So you do this once with a convolutional layer. You slide the, the filter in all locations, and you get your 256 uh, dimensional vector. But what you do is instead of predicting a, a fully connected layer of two positions and four positions, so in those sides, what you do is you predict 2K and 4K values. And this K relates to different boxes of different sizes of in the same, that are put in the, same, in the same location. So with only this 256 vector length vector, you're actually outputting scores for all these different uh, boxes of different sizes. Okay, so that's the trick that they use to, to sort of multi-scale with only one forward pass. Okay? So in the end, you get a bunch of uh, proposals that are ranked in objectness, so you could say this one is more likely to, have an, to be an object and this one is the last one, and you have the, the box regressed uh, uh, values. 
So, so yeah, so once you have that, you have, that would be the output of the origin proposal, so a set of uh, boxes that, that, that are ranked. And then this one, th these uh, boxes here are an input into the classification branch that we had before. Okay, so, it's, so, so from this point on, it's the same thing as, as faster CNN. So there's a problem with this uh, approach, though, that uh, it comes when, when you try to train it, and that is that, um, so when you do this uh, pooling, that you take the bounding box and you warp it and you apply it in the convolutional layer and you extract features, you're cropping. So cropping is not differentiable, because there's no way that you can uh, know how much you should move. Uh, so when the gradient comes from here, there's no way that you can go up here and keep back propagating because you've lost the information. So you don't know how much you should move the box coordinates based on the output of the class probabilities. So it's not differentiable. So what they did to overcome this in the original paper is just train uh, alternating uh, which branch do you train. So first you train the region proposals and you fix the, the classification branch. And then once that you've, you've trained that for a while, you fix it, and then you do it. Uh, so you, you change, you switch the, the parameters that you're training. So you begin here, you freeze the one below, and then you switch, and you keep alternating until it converges. So that's the trick that they, that they used. Then they improved it. Uh, what, what another trick is, so if you want to train end to end, that is without alternating, what you can do is just ignore that gradient. So the gradient that comes from the class probabilities, so from the loss, uh, the cross entropy loss, you just ignore it. So you, you don't use it to backpropagate through the region proposals network. So that's another solution. And there's another one that wasn't presented in this work, but we'll kind of sort of see it to, tomorrow, I think, in the attention class, which is find a you know, a clever way to make this function of cropping differentiable. So if you find a way to use these box coordinates in a way that you can backpropagate, then, then it's solved. But we'll see that tomorrow. So yeah, so in short, so since we're now sharing features, not only um, uh, among all the proposals, we're also sharing features to compute the proposals. Faster CNN is a lot faster than uh, faster CNN, and hence the name, you know. Yeah, and the performance is uh, basically uh, the same on Pascal. So since faster CNN, a lot of improvements have uh, come, and actually, uh, not exactly the same architecture, but faster CNN, faster CNN, sorry, has been the basis of the winners in this competition of uh, Microsoft Coco and ImageNet on object detection. Faster CNN has been the basis of, of the winning entries from last year and the year after that. So it's a, yeah, it worked really well. So uh, yeah, so now, so so uh, since since the, the beginning of the lecture, I've been talking about proposal-based uh, solutions for object detection. That is, you have an image and you have to predict some sort of locations and then you evaluate each one of the locations. But there are some uh, other uh, techniques that have come, uh, so started to come last year, which just go another way, which is I don't want proposals. I just want to feed my image once and get the output in terms of object detection. So the first one that I'm going to cover is it's called You Only Look Once, so YOLO, I guess. Yeah, it's <laughs> a cool name. So how does this work? So uh, yeah, it's mostly, so the convolutional part is nearly the same. So you get your uh, VGG or AlexNet architecture. And then, so you take your convolutional layer there. So it's a seven by seven uh, by 1024. That's the, the volume that you have. And then you just apply two fully connected layers. And at the end, you get a seven by seven by 30 output. And that output already has everything that you need. Okay, so we're gonna cover like what, what information is in this seven by seven by 30 output. So yeah, again, so this is the output. And then so what happens is that at each one of these rows here, these refer to different spatial locations in the image. And each one of these uh, rows has 30 values, right? So what in YOLO, what they do is that at each one of these locations, they predict two bounding boxes. So uh, the first set of outputs are the probability of each one of these predictions to be an object. So that's the first the P of object. And then you have the coordinates. And you have that for these two boxes that you're predicting at each location. So that's the first set of outputs. And then at the end, in order to make up to 30 values, you have the probabilities of each one of the categories in your data set. So you do that for all these different locations. So you have seven by seven vectors of this, of this kind. And each one has two boxes and the probabilities of, of, for that box. Whoops, sorry. <laughs> so, so yeah, so in the end, for an image, you get something like that. So that would be having its almost 100 boxes, so 49 by 2, so 7 by 7 by 2. And then for each one of these pixels, so 7 by 7 probabilities. So you're basically uh, classifying each one of these pixels in the 7 by 7 uh, array of features. 
So then if you combine these two informations, you get like this painted boxes. So for each location, you get the class that has been predicted. And then you here, you, as we did before, we do non-maximal suppression, we do some score threshold, and we get our detection. And that's done without proposals, which is nice. So there's another um, auto detection framework that was proposed that is very similar to this YOLO that I just introduced. So it's the same idea, but instead of having a single output that comes from the last convolutional layer, you do this, you just basically get this side connections at different convolutional layers in the architecture. So imagine you have AlexNet, you have five uh, convolutional layers. So instead of taking only the only one convolutional layer five and getting your predictions, you do it at several, you do it at com convolutional layer two, three, and five. And then in each one, you're predicting bounding boxes, so you have more predictions in the end. And you have them sort of at different scales, because the, the, the dimension of these features is different every time. Yeah. So then even more recently, there's this YOLO V2. I guess that you are sort of seeing the trend that this is happening all really fast. So what was trending two years uh, ago, now it's obsolete by, yeah, by now. So YOLO V2 just basically is the same architecture as YOLO, but they implemented all these features on top of it to be, to be better. So multi, uh, adding uh, multiple scales and batch normalization and doing it fully convolutional instead of uh, using fully connected layers. So yeah, all in all, a lot of improvements to this uh, architecture. And here are the basically faster CNN, SSD, and YOLO compared. So basically what it happens is that SSD and YOLO are a lot faster. And the, the comparison in, be, in between SSD and YOLO in terms of performance and faster CNN is more or less. So depending on what, what you want. Right? So if you want your system to be very fast, then maybe you need to go to YOLO, even though maybe you will lose some, some performance. So these results are in uh, Pascal uh, VOC, and this would be for, for Coco. So here in this example, SSD is better. But again, these are like the vanilla versions of these architectures, right? So if you, um, so when, when they submit entries to the, to the challenges, they do a lot of fancy things. They train multiple classifiers and then the performance improves. But, th but this would be only using the architecture that I, I described and training it on, on, the, on, the, on their data set. So yeah, as a summary, so I've introduced this proposal-based methods, RCNN, and their, you know, their enhanced versions that came after. Uh, I didn't cover others that are also based on proposals, but I've left the references here, and then the proposal-free uh, methods. And then here, as I yeah, did uh, yesterday, I put the, the original implementations of each one of them, but also know that if, I mean, any of these, uh, any of these uh, models, you can just find it in mostly any framework if you just use Google. And then I wanted to mention as well that uh, Google released a few days before, uh, before today uh, an API of object detection, and all these models are include, uh, included and pre-trained. So if you want to use it for your projects, I think it's a, it's a good idea. And here are some tutorials on object detection that I think are also interesting. But you can check that out later. So yeah, I'm done. Do you have any questions? <laughs>